it is, uh, I want to be Paul when I grow up. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's funny that there was some, some stuff on DSL reports and I feel, I feel kind of honored that, you know, uh, I feel like one of the only people that's works for Comcast that didn't get, you know, something enlarged. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a pleasant, humbling surprise. So, um, I'll, I'll try to not bore you. I, the funny thing about this meeting here, it's like a mini family reunion. Uh, I look around the audience, and as I'm probably the only knucklehead who's overdressed here, I see so many familiar faces. It's like a, I just wasn't expecting it. So it's, it's, you know, I feel like I'm just at a large dinner party here. So I'm going to kind of uh, be a little casual about this, but I will try to share some information with you that is not the same old stuff. Um, so Paul yells at me when I come here. Um, you know, when he invites me, and he doesn't want me to talk about the, the past. But a story about the future and the now, you know, needs a little, a little tee up about history, right? So the, the story of Comcast started a decade ago, and I, I don't know how I feel about that. You know, when I hear Paul say it out loud, I kind of feel maybe a little depressed, um, <clears throat> but uh, productive at the same time. Um, we started V6, unlike many other people, we use it for a lot of internal things. First and foremost is managing the DOCSIS interface on the vast majority of, our, of the devices that, that provide service to our customers. Uh, today, we are on the cusp of about 40 million of them. Um, you know, many years ago, there's something to the tune of 18 and some change. You'll see that 98, 99% of them, the blue line to the right, are all V6 only, no V4 whatsoever. These are things that you wouldn't see on the internet there's things that we care about. Um, one thing that you'll take note of is that green bar represents devices that would have never come online without IPv6. So you want your business case? There's one. That's a pretty good one. 100% uh, growth with, uh, wouldn't have been possible for those devices without IPv6. Um, that's a pretty good one, I think. That resonates at work, so it should resonate here. Um, our broadband deployment, stuff that you do care about, most people in this room. Um, you know, we've basically converted nearly every device that we are able to, to be dual stack enabled. Uh, We're currently at something like 85% and some change of our customers that are actively provisioned with native dual stack. Uh, maybe by this time next year, if we can kind of continue making progress with some of our retail friends and partners, we think that that number will get up somewhere like 90, 92%. And then basically it's old stuff that will probably you know, have to just melt down to be replaced with something that's V6 enabled. Um, but that's history, right? This is the past. Here's the now. Um, as Mr. Fessler knows, there's, there's been some stuff that we put on the corporate blog to talk about our deployment of V6 for our X1 platform. And yes, I'm on an animation kick, if anybody was wondering. Uh, I'm addicted. This line represents the migration of the beginning of the migration that I've been you know, sharing with you guys that is pending for a long time now over the past few months. New information, something, Paul, for you that you know, we probably have not put in slide format. That's almost a straight line up. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. And uh, that, that line is not, is, is not going to stop. It's going to keep going. There's, there's a lot more to go. There's about 20% uh, of them that are done. And by, 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 by the time I go on vacation, I promise, on 4th of July, we will be done. We will be done the, the migration of these devices, uh, 100%. And the line will look just like that. That's the now, right? That's a lot of what's been, what's been happening. So for, for those of you who are familiar with the X1 platform, you know, you, you know kind of what implications this has. And there are, there are things that are intended to work on it, right? So if anybody has it here, you'll notice that, you know, there's a Pandora app, for example, and, you know, some other apps that are out there that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a like button for Facebook, I think. Um, all those things have to work over V6 in order for this to be possible. Because remember, V6 only, no V4, right? No V4, right? Because remember, this, this line here and, and the trajectory of growth, we can't do it with V4, right? So, so, so history, that's history. So we're talking about where we've been. Um, and I, and I, I largely share that stuff with you to tell you, to share with you some information that kind of Paul insisted that I, I share is, you know, where do we go from here? What's next? Are we done, right? We're not even close. If, any, if anybody thinks this is done, um, then you know, hopefully you'll be, you'll be pleased with how the rest of this conversation goes. Because um, V6 is not just about more addresses. It, it was 10 years ago, right? And that, that was really kind of like the, the little hat that I, the little hook I can hang my hat on for the better part of, you know, 
you know, the first five years I worked at Comcast. But it, it's, it's really a lot more than that. It's a, it's a platform for innovation from our perspective. One of the things uh, that we're obviously looking at, you know, we, we've looked at V6.4 over the years, is you know, reducing our dependency on V4. At this stage of the game, it is, it is clear that the majority, you know, 60, 70 percent growing, the majority of what we do in the network today to run the business, we do over V6. Um, and it's only going to continue to grow. Over the next few years, it's going to keep climbing and climbing closer to, to 100%. Um, and the punch line for that will be you know, the, the back nine of this deck. Um, our internet continues, uh, the, the actual utilization, and, and, I, and I cannot emphasize more the points that were made earlier. Um, we really need you know, the content space to, uh, to kind of turn V6 on by default. Today, about 25% of our internet traffic is V6. Um, there are some folks that, uh, we, that, we, that we know over half of our traffic, <coughs> Facebook, um, happens over IPv6. Um, and there are many others as well. So um, it's, it's happening. It's there. The bits, the bits are there for V6. Um, but really, what I'm here to talk to you about is how do we leverage all this great work that we've done? We, we, we haven't had to deploy V6 more than one time. Uh, we basically leveraged V6 as kind of a building block platform where we were able to take the stuff that we did in phase one, use it for phase two, phase two for phase three, and, and, and not have to reinvent the wheel each time. So for us, it's very much been a platform, you know, a building block platform for innovation. So the punchline here is basically, you know, you know, what is V4 as a service? And why do you care? A friend of mine a few moments before the talk started, say, hey, when are you going to start charging a premium for V4 resources? I say, no, let's, let's, let's change the nature of that conversation for a second, and let's uh, talk about it in a different way. V4, as, we, as, as you just got done hearing, you know, it's, it is the way that we run the business, right? Um, and those resources don't last forever, right? We, we've came to that conclusion a long, long time ago. And we've done everything that we can, and more, to really kind of make sure that our business and the future of our business is built on something that is extensible, right? My, my job, in, in some ways, like if you were my coworker, my job is to say, hey, Owen, you're going to talk to me for a few months, and you should never see me again. Because my job is to get out of Owen's way so that he can go build things to make the company money, to make the customers happy, to do things better, right? That's my job. My job is to go talk to Owen, nag the heck out of him for months, maybe even make him angry at me for a short period of time, but then he never hears from me again. And maybe a few years down the road, he'll call, he'll call me up and say, thanks, right? But, but after the day's done, that, that's, that, I mean, I t you know, in all seriousness, that's part of one of the big parts of what I view my, you know, my role to be is to, is to clear the runway so that we can, we can grow the business. V4 is not the way. So, so V4 is a service, right? You know, as, as kind of Paul alluded to earlier and as many of us really know, and, and, and you know, one of the ways that we've been thinking about V4 is you know, V4 to the internet, you know, if John Kern were here, he'd tell you, you know, it's not the internet unless it's V4 and V6, right? Um, the, the internet's not just V4, and it's, it's true. Broadband, that's dual stack, requires that v, V6 be part of that experience as you know, kind of an overlay service. It is, it is the service, right? But interestingly enough, over time, we're realizing that you can also use V6, and, I, and I'm sure with, the, with many of the familiar phrases in this room, I'm not, I'm not splitting the atom here for you guys. I'm not kind of you know, showing or sharing anything with you that you haven't heard of before. But one of the things that we've also started to look at is using v, V6 as the underlay, right? Using V6 to carry other things. Sometimes V6, but most of the time V4. Think back to the slide I just had and say, okay, um, V6 utilization is increasing. It means V4 eventually will go down, right? And it'll, start, it'll go down towards zero, right? Um, so you say to yourself, wow, it seems like a perfect candidate for something like you know, a V6 underlay. Um, and really the focus here is to make sure that as V4 continues to kind of decline in use, becomes, well, c continues to decline as a, or, or, or I guess uh, for lack of a better term, continue to kind of go down the path of being a, a you know, second class citizen on the internet, um, the idea here is to make sure that we kind of manage the customer experience, right? So as V4 continues to go away, we want to make sure that, you know, we don't, like, just rip the Band-Aid off. Then we probably, you know, somewhat of a soft landing for that, right? Just maybe not that soft, right, but soft enough, right? And this really kind of revolves around content and points. So you heard a lot of emphasis around the fact that content is lacking. It is a true statement. It is, it is a concern of ours, right? Um, but we have some, some very high hopes for 2016 and, and different things to happen on that front. But one of the things that does worry me 
separately, um, you know, compared to what you heard earlier, is our endpoints. Things like smart TVs, Blu-ray players, over-the-top you know, video players and such. A lot of that space is lacking from a V6 support point of view. Um, and not only that, but, but you know, the, the strange thing is as many of the hosts are ICV6 enabled, it's the apps that are on top of them that people seem to forget you have to turn V6 support on for. Um, but I think they're getting, I think they will get there, similar to content. So what is V4 as a service? Um, V4 as a service, carrying, in this case, in this context, carrying IPv4 communications over an IPv6 transport. So you have a household here. Does this thing work? Oops. Uh, you have a household here on the left that's dual stack today. You have um, a V6 only connection to the internet. So for all of you guys, and I'm sure there's, there's plenty of people who know how the internet works in this room, this means the outside interface of your broadband connection no longer has a V4 address. You just have a V6 address. Your LAN will still have V6. Why? Because I'm not going to break the internet, and I'm not going to break your house, right? So what happens now is you have, on the, of, of your WAN, you have a V6-only connection, right? You have no more V4. So what ends up happening is, in this scenario, you leverage the cloud, other really kind of cute acronyms that we'll talk about a little bit more, hopefully put some more meat behind, some overused acronyms that we see here in our space, and you have a dual-stack customer premise, and any device that is V4-only, like the red line, the, the computer with the red line coming from it, basically now will have its communications carried over a V6 transport to the cloud or some you know, transition technology device. In this case, you'll see it'll be MAP. Um, it could be anything, though. It could be GRE, for those of you who have an affinity to it. We, we're not really married to, to any, any, any one of these things in particular. I'll share with you some things that, we're, that we've looked at from, from kind of a technology point of view as far as V4 as a service is concerned. And now... That V4 communication from that laptop, that TV, that whatever, right, is carried over V6 to the cloud and then out to the internet from the cloud over V4, right? Um, not, not rocket science, but any stretch of the imagination. And I expect and hope that there'll be lots of lively discussions later. Um, and you can insert your V4 as a te te uh, technology service here. You can, it could be MAP, um, it could be carry grade NAT for that matter. Uh, take a pick. Um, and your native V6 communications, those packets flow the way God intended them to flow, natively, straight to the internet, right? Um, so as we continue to go more and more down this path, you know, more, I mean, you, know, you, have to, you have to kind of acknowledge, I mean, a huge percentage of my customers have V6 today, right? A lot of, a lot of V6 is being utilized on the internet today, you know, at very minimal on the Comcast network. So last slide. I'm going to talk about some, some scenarios here where this, this actually applies in real life, okay? So applicability. So you can, you can all kind of envision care of the picture before here, you know, a broadband scenario. Well, one of the things that you guys may also kind of be familiar with, particularly in this part of the country, is Xfinity Wi-Fi. It's an open Wi-Fi SSID that we, that we put out in public places. Interestingly enough, that technology, that offering that we have, uses GRE from the access point to an overlay concentrator, what we call a, a WAG. It's basically a, an overlay access, uh, concentrator point. Well, that GRE tunnel today is V4. Tomorrow, I'll give you three guesses what it's going to be. It'll be V6, right? Just another flavor of V4 as a service, right? Xfinity Home, anybody who has their home security system. Now, our plan is to move that to be native V6 capable, right? Just like we've said very, you know, very publicly in you know, blog posts and what have you. But I live, I live in a world where the field is brown. The field is not green, right? And what that means is, is inevitably, I have to deal with things that cannot be upgraded to support IP6. That's life, right? So in this case in particular, for Xfinity Home, if I have legacy gear that doesn't support IP6, I can't turn it off. I have to carry it over V4 as a service. Infrastructure, we're looking at things like SIIT and other things like that, where we make the, our virtual machines, our virtualized infrastructure, V6 only. Well, but what if, what if something is using that infrastructure that's, that's V4? Well, we have another tool in our tool belt that we could potentially use for that. One, one parting thought that I will I'll throw out there for you, you know, my, my final kind of punctuated use case, so to speak, for V4 as a service is, just say, for, hypothetically speaking, you're building a new building, and you wanted to make that new building V6 only, you know, new, a new campus, a new corporate office. Um, 
what a great opportunity that is to really kind of go down the path of making V6 only. But I think everybody in the room, just given everything that you've talked about today, realizes that maybe even in 2018 timeframe, that's not something that is going to be 100% achievable. It'll be pretty damn close though, right? But what that really means is you'll have to pull that from your tool belt, V4 as a service. So one of the things that, that we've talked about from that point of view are things like NAT64, NAT4, uh, and DNS64, right? Um, the, the tool belt now is pretty, um, it, it's, looking pretty, it's looking pretty good, to be perfectly honest with you. The, the difference between now and five years ago, 10 years ago, as it relates to V4 transition is, is there's just a lot more V6 happening on the internet today compared to those different points in time. So being able to move and talk about the idea that um, you're going to deploy a V4 as a service technology, it's, it's a lot more believable now, I guess is the best way I'll put it, right? Because years ago when things like dual stack light and other things you know, came about, people would say, oh, you know, just go ahead and deploy it. But the economics behind it was actually not believable because V4 was still, was still growing. It was still growing in, in a very upwards and to the right kind of trajectory. But now we're getting to the point where we, we think before the end of this year, um, our, our, our V6 traffic will be over half of our traffic. Um, and I think we're being conservative from, from that point of view. So from, from our perspective, we see this as exactly the right time to plan for kind of the retirement of V4. I think with that, I'll close with some things that we're looking at doing. Um, you heard about MAP, heard about GRE, a lot of what we're looking at here for, so for anybody in the room who tracks some of the, uh, the uh, FIDO, FD.io work, uh, we're looking at some of that as uh, you know, some, of the, some of the tools that we use to kind of prepare uh, for V4 as a service. And you know, for what it's worth, this is a perfect space for a virtualized network function. You know, for, for years now, you know, you, know, you know, we get people coming into the office talking about you know, NFV, SDN, all these acronyms, you know, and man, there's just so little substance behind some of those statements. <laughs> uh, thank you. And, uh, and we're, we're trying to actually put something on the map there. We think, we think a virtualized network function in the form of a map BR um, or even a category net for that matter, where the V4 traffic is at, is at its peak and declining, feels like a perfect opportunity for something like a virtualized network function. So with that, um, you know, I kind of blazed through some slides here. I will open up to you for us to have a conversation. Don't be shy. Jason. So obviously, six is important for performance, and four is going to have a bit of a penalty. Um, as people have V4-only products and performance is a concern, what type of penalty are we looking at with V4 as a service for people running these legacy-only services? Uh, I think, Jason, inevitably, that the answer to that question lies around two things. In a, in a strange way, so it, it, it all boils down to ports. Ports become the new currency. Right? That's what it boils down to, right? And what I mean by ports are like if you take your slash 32 for V4 that you get today, you have all, you know, you're able to kind of access all 65,535,000 ports. That won't be the case in the future, right? I mean, you hear from different points of view, people, I mean, let's start with it won't be all 65,000 ports, okay? Um, if you look at my Mac, your Mac, Paul's Mac, Ellen's Mac, my Mac is a port hawk. I probably have 1,000 ports open on my, on my Mac right now, right? Um, you know, and I think what you're going to find is most people, you know, light Facebook users, right? Maybe some Amazon email, right? They might not notice, right? I'll, I'll defer to Paul, right? But like people who are doing some more like intense things like gaming, they might they might notice, right? Um, I think the other answer to that is, you know, stay tuned. You know, as we as we did with native v6 when we first launched that, as we did with some of the early trials that we did. You know, I, I expect that you know half of the people in this room will have their chance to become like part of their friends and family trial that we've done for other, you know, for other aspects of V6, and you'll get to see for yourself, right? And you'll get to use, one of the things that we've, I think, you know, hopefully you guys will agree, that we've done a pretty good job at is making some of the early V6 technology available to you so that you can assess for yourself what it means to you and your company. Um, you know, I, think, I think that's how, you know, even today, that's how we move the needle a lot for IPv6 kind of just adoption. But, but similarly for, for V4 as a service, you know, when, when we roll out you know, that in trial format, you know, we, we can, we'll have the opportunity to say, hey, you get, you get 128 ports, you get 1,000 ports. 
you know, I think I think you and I both recognize, and everybody in the room recognizes, is that that's that's non-trivial. You know, generally speaking, right? You know, it, it is it is one sixty-fifth of what you know you have today. Dave. Uh, nice, nice, nice talk, John. Um, I was wondering about. I really am attracted to this idea of uh, NAT64 and getting people on native v6. And the, one of the things that I wanted to mention was uh, Jen Link of uh, at Google was looking into this complication about it, uh, about it breaking DNSSEC yep. and, and surveying, you know, what subset of the content that would affect. And and uh, so so we know there are a couple stumbling blocks. What do you think we should be doing right now? In either standards or as operators to make that NAT64 thing work well, or, or or something alternatively. And and one of the one of the leading things is we know we need v4 addresses on the CG NAT. So there's a remissioning still of some v4 addresses, but think of dedicating them to that transition. Yep. Anyway, that's a big deal. I mean, if there's one thing that you know, and we, I saw Jen somewhere. I can't remember where it was, but that when whenever we all saw her together, like that. I said, oh man, that that's gonna suck, right? Um, and I said, you know, that that that's a serious problem. I, I I don't have an answer for you, but it's real, right? Because this 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 you know, like for example, one of the things that I'm kind of like you know being coy about is like we're we're actually looking at some V6 only offices, right? I, I'm sure that's old news to Paul, right? But like and, and others, but like for us, it's a it's a pretty big deal. And um, that that whole idea of NAT64, DNS64, break in DNS sec is is because because that happens to be like you know if if you know we took off my V6 hat off and this was a DNS meeting, you know we happen to be pretty significant adopters of, of DNS sec as well. The thing, uh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, the the thing to do is if you if you care about DNS sec and people being able to authenticate your site, get that property on V6, get your CDN to do it, get whatever. Uh -huh. um, I mean that that that's that that's one step. Uh, but but good, the good thing was she was measuring it's a fairly low percentage. So you start talking single digits, and you're like, maybe we can hmm. push, and people will notice. Yeah, I, I didn't hear about her data. I, I, I think that goes without saying, though. You know, you don't want you don't want to go through, uh, well, you know, you don't want to go through, uh, you know, NAT64, DNS64, and then turn on V6. I mean, I think that inevitably that's that's the, you know what we're pushing everybody for. One of the other things that that you know Martin, myself, you, and others have talked about. Um, is when you have V4 as a service. If I can go back, I don't know if I if I'm not able to do that anymore. Um, the one of the things that we're worried about is if you have your DNS queries going. All right, so if you have your DNS queries for Quad A records using a V4 transport going over V4 as a service, that's bad. Oh, thank you. Right. So one of the things that we're one of the things that we're talking about. One of the, so related to DNS, Dave, is one of the things that we are. That we're talking about, and we were also worried about because this is actually much larger than scale. I mean, it's one thing if we do a building, right? It's another thing if you do like 24 million broadband customers, right? Or some 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 subset of them. If you look here for the V4 line, right, the gateway in that in, in that scenario could easily kind of do you know flip, flip the address family and use a local DNS cluster. Otherwise, think about the communications that has to happen over V4 as a service. If that all starts off with a whole host of DNS queries, right, that all have low TTLs, well, guess what? The thingy in the cloud that is providing the V4 as a service is spending a huge portion of its time translating DNS. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Yep. Tom. Tom nice talk. What's up, buddy? How's it going? Tom Coffey with Infoblox. Um, so my question is more focused towards enterprises because that's who our, most of our customers are. Um, and you know, there's sort of a tortured history with how DHCP became a popular protocol back in the day, and and how enterprises have used it, you know, and given us sort of a nice long runway with IPv4, especially in the enterprise space, to get to IPv6. Uh, but now we're sort of faced with this scenario where, you know, when I go into an enterprise and I'm trying to browbeat them into adopting IPv6, and of course the reality is it's already running on their network, and they're they're just not managing it effectively in most cases. Um, but when I'm, I'm trying to get, convince them that they need to have, you know, a, a real IPv6 adoption initiative and think about it seriously and pointing to all the statistics that you've gone over uh, very effectively here, you know, the, the next question out of their mouth is, well, you know, how am I going to manage auto-addressing? Uh, I, I use DHCP today and v4. I want to use DHCP v6, you know, ostensibly. And uh, there's a lot of pain there. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, cr there's a lot of sort of a lot of directions to go in in terms of configuration, a lot of ways in which clients behave in very strange ways and unpredictable ways and seem to change from release to release. It seems to be getting better, 
and then you know without sort of uh, dipping my toe too much into the religious war about whether you know certain mobile devices should support DHCPv6 or not uh, you know that of course complicates things greatly for enterprises who who want to have sort of a single management scheme so I was just wondering if I could get get your opinion on that um, just based on you know you've got sort of the long view of IPv6 and, and I'd, I'd really like to hear what, what you have to say about that yep uh, yeah yeah, can you can you take the micro him so it doesn't throw at me? Uh, so I I have one religion and it's just you know get stuff done right. That's for me I whatever like everything else doesn't matter right. So like I, I watched all those kind of Android battles go back and forth. I I don't care right. Um, I only care about being able to kind of do two things: move the ball and not piss my my coworkers off. Right, it's always a good it's always a good plan right. So if I roll out V6 and they can't do their job, I am suddenly very unpopular at work. Um, and uh, that's not a good place to be when you're trying to basically transform, you know, fundamental technology components that, that, that kind of span the, the, the company, right? So what we did, Tom, honestly, is um, we kind of deployed whatever we needed to to get the job, right? So, like, if there's a Microsoft guy here, right, most, most every Microsoft guy that I ever hear talk says, ah, I said tap, we regret that. I say, hey, man, I love that. I turn that on, like, everywhere. Right, because I needed to, because I have all these remote offices that you know it'll be years before I get a chance to uh, before I get a chance to do a native V6 upgrade. Right, I don't use DHCP V6 in the enterprise either. Right, I use Slack. It works. Right, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, you name it. Right, where I use DHCP is where I have to. Right, when we when we built V6 for Doxis a decade ago, and I was part of that small group of people did it, I needed DHCP V6, and we used it, and it works. Right. Um, I even use TFTP over IP6, which phew, just gives you an idea of you know pretty pretty much how you know how gnarly it was. You know that a lot of that's moving to HTTP, right? But like, so that, that's my feel, right? Like, you know, if uh, if our good friend Lorenzo was here, I tell him I, I always tell him privacy. I, I think someday you'll, you'll implement it, right? I think you, you know you get a big enough customer someday that comes you know walking around that says I want this, and and you'll probably do it, right? I said I don't need it. The one thing that I do notice right now is there's one piece that is missing from an enterprise point of view. It's learning DNS server IPv6 addresses. That's a big deal, right? I, my, my biggest beef with this whole DHCP Slack war was I don't have a way to create a v6 only experience. And it was, it was all oriented around Wi-Fi, right? So that, that's, that, that to me was like the biggest, uh, you know, the, the biggest driver. One more. One more. Owen. RFC 6106. 100% agree. Just not universally supported. But I think we're, I th it's, we're getting there. I agree 100%. So I'm getting the hook, I think. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.